If the Bible's got you tied in knots, if you're burdened with religious thoughts, come grab a drink and join the choir. It's Heretic Happy Hour. So, hey, everyone, welcome to the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. Uh, uh, I am one of your hosts, Keith Giles. I'm the author of Jesus Unbound, Liberating the Word of God from the Bible. And I am joined by my two other choir author co-host friends, Matthew and Jamal. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. This is Jamal. It's a pleasure to be back on the Heretic Happy Hour podcast with you all. And this is uh, Matt DeStefano enjoying this lovely Friday morning, sipping my coffee, excited for another episode to chat about all the good things we chat about here on the Heretic Happy Hour. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, uh, we have a special announcement here. Uh, hey, hey, Alabama Heretics, Hi, yeah, Alabama. Keith Giles will be speaking at the Proactive Love Conference in the Birmingham area on Saturday, September the 15th to talk about how loving our enemies changes everything. Learn more and register today at Proactive Love AL. That's AL for Alabama. Proactive Love AL dot com. Who, who the hell is Keith Giles? I don't know. You know, they, why? Uh, they just pay us to read this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just glad it, it's not just a it, it, and I'm glad it doesn't just say AF. Uh, it was like Proactive Love AL. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would have been cool though. Yeah, yeah, be okay. cool. <laughs> um hey, hey guys, uh I don't, you know, I want I want if it was okay, I would like to make an announcement. I have a special announcement. Yeah, uh, we know. Yes. We know. No, we have a hotline. Yeah. Yes. Of what? Course. No. I'm not talking about guys, listen. I listen, I had a I have a real announcement. I don't please like Oh, sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, Play it up. Play it up. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We're really, no, this real announcement, this is this is historic and groundbreaking. We've never announced this before ever on the Heretic Happy right. Hour podcast. <laughs> I am so excited. And I don't know why I, you know, you guys aren't taking my announcement seriously, but um, but this announcement is completely new because I am here to announce to you that we have officially opened our online store. We have a Heretic Happy Hour podcast online store. So if you go to the Heretic, we go to heretichappyhour.com. That's a website, by the way. <laughs> so you go to heretichappyhour.com. There is a link at the top of the page that says store. And you, there's some really cool yeah. merchandise that we have available for the listeners. Yeah, we got mugs, awesome. shirts, and I heard that yeah. the, the designs are great. And hopefully you can spot all the nuances our designer did because he he did a good job. Super excited about the store. Oh, yeah. And thank you for not lying to us and actually having a fucking announcement, Jamal. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh, oh that is awesome. Well, I, I also have another, uh, I have an announcement as well, another one. Um, we ha also have a Patreon page. Uh, this is for those of you who like really, really, really love the podcast and you want to help support what we're doing. And, uh, and by the way, we thank you all so much. We just passed the $600 mark, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty excited about that. And we want to, um, thank our most recent supporters on the Patreon page. You helped us put us over that mark. That would be Trevor Arnold, uh, Erica Joanna, Stuart Zahn, Dominic Shorentino, Victoria Bhutan, Faith Overhaul, documentary i think that, that's the guy who did the, the uh, interview yeah with us. yeah uh awesome hey thanks man nicholas williams epaphras dove i love that name mike coolen amber smith karen belcher and patrick dyer god bless you, you one and yeah. all and by the way if, if you if you haven't supported us yet on the patreon page you can just go to um i guess it's patreon.com slash heretic happy hour and um we have different levels there uh you can you can support the podcast you get as a, as a uh, supporter, you get to unlock. We record bonus content, bonus interviews. We do bonus videos and podcasts and, and posts. I think we're going to be giving away an ebook, um, all kinds of awesome, really cool stuff that you get for being a supporter. Just our way of saying thank you. And um, our goal is, if we, I think the next goal, if we hit it, we're going to we're going to be able to put the podcast uh, every week instead of every other week. Hell yeah. So yeah, go yeah. over there and check that out. Yeah, yeah, that'll be that awesome. yeah we, we really do want to be able to, to, to do these podcasts weekly. So thank you. Yeah. Again, we, we uh, try to help us hit that second goal that we're after. If you, if you are listening to this and you haven't been on uh, the Patreon page and contributed, um, we'd love uh, for you to join our team. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Which 
I guess it makes it uh, time in the show for uh, the heretic of the week. It's the heretic of the week. Hi, my name is Nadia, and I am a heretic. Hi, Hi Nadia. Nadia. <laughs> Nadia, thank you. Thank you so much for being our guest on the Heretic Happy Hour podcast. Uh, as we ask all of our guests at the top, we want to just find out from you, um, what are some of the reasons that people have called you a heretic? Uh, I think uh, just being a girl pastor is one. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are, to be honest, there are a million reasons I shouldn't be a pastor, but literally being a girl is not one of them. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I think uh, my gender um, uh, also, I think this outrageous notion that I have that the gospel is free and for all, uh, that there is no longer Jew nor Greek, male nor female, gay nor straight. Like, I don't sort of believe in the same designations other Christians do, uh, believe in, in terms of who's allowed at the table and who's allowed in the doors and who's allowed in the pastorate. So I think that's a pretty big one. Yeah, yeah, that that seems for for whatever reason that seems to rub people the wrong way. <laughs> I I don't I don't Correct. get it. Yeah, if, yeah. if you accept the wrong people, yeah. Well, well, Nadia, my name is uh, Jamal, and um, first of all, it's just great to have you on the hair to Capiar. So thanks for taking time out of you. I know you're you're busy and you have a, a full schedule, so I really appreciate you taking time to join us on the podcast. Um, I had just a you know a question that comes to mind, and, and this is actually just one that comes from my own life. A um, number of years ago, um, I was a local church pastor and, and you know, went to college and did the whole, you know, you know, traditional route of like, you know, going, you know, studying, you know, got a degree in, in um, pastoral studies and that kind of thing. And we talked at, at our, co at our university, like we talked a lot about leadership and spiritual leadership and, you know, obviously studying to be in the clergy and that kind of thing. Um, like I was, very much preoccupied with the role or the office of what it meant to be a pastor. Cause that's what I was studying to become. And I wrestle and like, I, I don't know how I missed this, but you know, I, o along the way, I remember just reading the words of Jesus and going, wait a minute, I just, something doesn't feel right here. So like specifically um, like Matthew 23, um, when, when Jesus says, don't, don't let, and of course he's talking to his disciples and he's, you know, speaking to the, to the religious, you know, uh, world of his day, which is not really unlike ours. Um, he said, don't let anyone call you rabbi for you have one, only one teacher and all of you are equal as brothers mm -hmm. and sisters and don't address anyone here on earth as father for only God in heaven is your spiritual father. And don't let anyone call you teacher for you have only one teacher. The greatest among you must be a servant. Um, and I just remember reading that and as I'm studying to be a pastor, and obviously then later on becoming a pastor, I'm just feeling I that when I got into the office of pastor, and obviously the, the tradition I come from, I, mean, I went to a Southern Baptist university. So it's all obviously no women are allowed to be in the um, you know, in, in in the pastorate, so to speak. And then uh, obviously my mom is Catholic, so I come from a you know, she was a very strict Roman Catholic, and obviously in the Catholic tradition, there's no women priests and women are given a very low role in the clerical offices. And then of course, like my dad's Muslim comes from Muslim background. So in Islam, you know, women have a, a very low place in traditional uh, religious life and practice of Islam. So my <laughs> religion has not been nice to women or good to women, obviously um, over the years. But my question is, and I just want to ask you, because now uh, as someone who is in, the office of a pastor, uh, you know, because you serve as pastor of a local church. How do you understand what it means to be a pastor in light of like everyone's on the same page? Um, like, how do you reconcile the office of pastor versus um, the function of pastor? What do you, what do you, how do you view yourself as pastor in light of what Jesus was talking about here? Like Matthew 23, like everyone being kind of on the same plate, plane. Uh, well, I think. The office of pastor just means that a community has said, hey, we want to, we're going to set you apart to serve a certain role on our behalf. And it's not that, it, and, and in a way, you're, you don't have the same freedoms as everyone else in the community. So 
for instance, like I'm not free to have a con- personal conversation with someone at church and then talk to other people about it. I'm not free to flirt with people in my congregation. I'm not free to espouse anything other than what I think is uh, the gospel, right? So in a way, you're just sort of set apart to not have the same freedoms as everyone else. And um, and to sort of do really particular work on their behalf, you know? Other people are not probably spending hours and hours and hours every single week studying scripture, listening to the stories of people, trying to weave those things together into some kind of proclamation for the church, you know? So you're sort of set apart to do certain things. So I I guess I've never seen it as being like the professional Christian or the person who's more holy than everyone else or who has more insight than everyone else. I mean, especially my form of leadership. I mean, the thing that qualifies me to do this work is I have a fairly keen awareness of my own sin enough. <laughs> and I believe, I believe so strongly in grace that I'm unashamed to talk about needing it. And so my job is to put those two things together in front of people and to admit how much I personally need grace as a way of, of sort of pointing to how powerful it is and why it's actually good news. Like I'm unafraid of the bad news about myself because I'm so clear about the good news that God offers. And so it's a form of leadership. I call screw it. I'll go first. Right. I'll just, (laughs) I'll just say the thing. I love it. You know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, w- I want to. I'm curious about how. I mean, because the the kind of a church that you're leading, Nadia, is um, where whereas it might be structured in sort of a traditional way, like Jamal saying, where you're a pastor and there there's a staff and there are people in your church. It if anybody uh, went and visited your church, they might be in for some surprises because it is not typical or traditional in many other ways, and I think some very important ways. So, can you talk a little bit about um, your church and what sets you guys apart and some things you guys that do that are a little bit different? Yeah, I think it is actually very traditional. It's just not conventional. So um, right. I think people are shocked at how traditional the liturgy is and the fact that we sing early American hymns almost exclusively. That's the music. Um, but we have a, it's a sort of high church liturgy, uh, but that's done in an unconventional way and with an unconventional population in terms of church. My dad says it's kind of like high church at the Star Wars cantina. It feels a little like that. <laughs> so, um, I yeah, like that. That sounds yeah, fun. He's not wrong. And, um, and so for instance, we're, t- we're in the round. So the altar is in the center and we oh. sit in concentric circles around the altar. So there's no front or back. Oh, wow. And so we've, we've democratized like the space and the clergy just, we sit usually in that first circle of chairs, but we're just with everyone else. And the whole liturgy is led by different members of the community. And so um, when people walk in, they're asked, Hey, do you want to help lead the liturgy? And so you can walk in having never been to a Christian service in your life. And you'll be asked if you want to be the assisting minister at the Eucharist, or if you want to read the gospel or serve communion or do one of the prayers. And um, so we basically give people the message that's actually welcoming, right? Like a lot of churches do do not understand the difference between being welcoming and being friendly. And, um, right. And so uh, I don't know how friendly we are, but we're very welcoming. <laughs> and so we, we, we basically are saying to people, just because you walked in the door, we trust you with the holy things. There's no, wow. there are no thing. There are no sort of red ropes here with a bouncer that has to determine whether you're worthy or not, not just to receive the Eucharist, yeah. but to even serve it. Right. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, but then, but then there'll be this really traditional Eucharistic prayer, you know, and we, we do the Sanctus and the Agnus Dei, and we chant the Kyrie, and we always chant a psalm, and we're singing these early American hymns. So it's, it's traditional. It's just not done in a conventional way. Wow. That sounds so beautiful. I, you know, um, I, I think uh, it's a similar. I have a, my, a good friend. His name is Dan Naughty, who lives here in Orange County, California. And he and his wife have been attending, and I think it's a Lutheran church, 
And it sounds very similar to what you're saying. It's also in the round. And there's a whole lot of body ministry where the people in the church, the people in the body are very spontaneous to come and pray for, you know, people that, that need prayer or to come up and encourage people or to speak or share or use their gifts. And it's a very, it's such a beautiful thing. It's like really giving what away the it? ministry. I, I knew you were going to ask me that. I can't think of the name of it. Um, Where is it? What city? I think they're in like Brea or something like that or huh, somewhere, uh, Placentia, awesome. maybe something like that. But, um, okay. but anyway, it sounds, it's just a, it's very similar. It's very beautiful. And, uh, and that's so uncommon. I mean, do you think, let me ask you this. Do you think this may be hard for you to, to answer this, but do you think that what draws people to your church, is it that, is it that when they come in, it's such an open, welcoming, participatory thing? Or do you think it's that you are a woman or do you think it's that you are welcoming to everyone and anybody? Or do you think it's a combination of things? Like, what do you think it is that draws people to your church? Because uh, they heard my interview on Fresh Air. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I I have a sort of large footprint, I think, in terms of media, and so people hear of me, and they then they look, and then they hear of the church, and then they want to come visit. Now, that's never kept anyone there. But I think a lot of times they hear stories about the church and how it's like, oh, that's how I've always thought church should be. I'll go check it out. And either they fall in love with it and they become a part of it or they go, no, this isn't for me. And they move on or, you know, I mean, we have a lot of people in and out. We have a great deal of of church tourism, to to be honest. We have thousands of -of out-of-town visitors every Sunday. and um, Yeah, they're just coming to check out a spectacle. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, some of them are there to worship. Some of them are there to like touch the hem of the garment. And uh, I'm never, I'm, I'm never, I'm never sort of keen about that, to be honest. Like, um, my my congregation is very generous in sharing me all the time. They shouldn't have to share me on Sundays, you know, with somebody with a you know Presbyterian pastor visiting from Iowa. Um, like those moments on Sunday are for my congregation, you know. So. Uh, when people come to worship, we love that. But when people come and sort of feel entitled to like have one-on-one interactions with me in my parish on Sunday when I'm surrounded by my own parishioners whose needs I'm aware of, that's not that's not cool. Right. Yeah. Well, Nadia, thank you. I appreciate you, what you're sharing. Um, I, I um, I I, th- I think one of the the questions that that comes to mind um is. Is, you know, I, I know from a traditional, like kind of going back to what I was sharing, like when I was obviously studying to be a pastor and this whole idea that it's this hierarchical kind of leadership kind of thing, um, then what it, what I have found it does is that a lot of people feel unqualified. So they feel like, oh, well, that's not me. I'm not in that position kind of thing. And then, of course, it was very male-centered. But then I am start- I started to question like, okay, well, this is not just a male thing. Like, I don't know that, I think based on what Jesus was saying in Matthew 23, like, look, this office in a sense of like, Jesus is saying, look, don't call anyone. Don't put anyone up on this pedestal. So when Jesus is saying yeah, that, he's saying, this isn't just for men. This isn't for anybody. It's not, just, it's not, it's not a gender specific, even no. though men think right. they're like that they, they've had the right to do this and w- they keep women out of that. But like, so for you, so now you're, you're obviously you're challenging these, these traditional roles and you're saying, okay, no, like I'm not, you know, not playing by these rules. I'm just curious how for you, you overcame like how how did you get to a place where you said, "Hey, you know what? I actually have a voice," because that, I feel I find that that is a challenge for most people <laughs> in the church uh-huh. is that they feel like they don't have a voice. Um, they're not allowed to talk mm. or speak. Yeah, especially sure. especially women. I guess I do hear other women say, "You know, I'm trying to I'm discovering my voice." You know, I'm like, God, that has never been my issue. Shutting the hell up has much more been my struggle in life than finding my. Yeah, how did you get to <laughs> what led to you? Because I'm, I would imagine you, your background, you come from a Church of Christ background, which is pretty, you know, honestly, I mean, my my understanding of that is pretty restrictive, a pretty. Um, so how would how is someone with a Church of Christ background where it's very like, what caused you to say, you know what, screw that, screw all this this. Uh, the ideas about who should do what. And I have a voice, have a role to play. What led to you making that decision? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I never even heard a woman pray out loud uh, in front of men until I was in my mid-20s. 
uh, because of my religious background. But, you know, I left the Church of Christ when I was like 17 years old. So I spent a decade outside of Christianity entirely um, in and instead existed in um, actual reality. <laughs> and, uh, and I discovered uh, it, that actual reality um, is not a thing to be afraid of or to sort of protect mm-hmm. yourself from. And so I think ever since then, I've had this conviction that I think that theology and preaching uh, and pastoring, that actual reality should always be our starting point, not an idea, not a doctrine not an interpretation of a Bible verse, but the actual reality of actual people in the real world Mm. right in front of us. And so if a woman has, uh, has, you know, the gifts to be a preacher, are we going to go, well, you know, we're going to deny that that's true, the actual thing right in front of us. And instead we're going to stick with an interpretation of a, of a line in a letter that uh, that somebody wrote to another person two thousand years ago, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like the the things that we that we have more loyalty to than actual people. And um, I have a book. You know, you you guys really should have waited to interview me until my book came out in January because. I have a book called Shameless, A Sexual Reformation that comes out in January, where I basically take all this shit that the church has taught people about sex and the body and gender, all these things. It's really, it really came out of a space of pastoral anger, to tell you the truth, because I saw the way the things that my parishioners were told from the church about sex and sexual orientation and gender in their bodies. And I, it's not hard to draw a direct line between what they were told and the harm in their lives and in their bodies as a result of what they were taught. And so I'm like, we should never be more loyal to an idea or an ideal or a doctrine or an interpretation of a verse than Mm. we are to people. When when anybody went to Jesus and said, hey, you know, what What are your favorite rules? Like, you know, he's like, look, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And so if the teachings of his own church are harming people, that's not wow. loving. And yet over and over, the church has been more loyal to doctrine and interpretations of Bible verses than they are to people. And so in the book, I'm not suggesting a few simple amendments to what the church has taught because there's been just so much harm in people's lives. I'm like, burn it the hell down and start over. It's, it's, t- it, we have to stop. We have to stop. Mm-hmm. Wow. That is, that's phenomenal. That is, that, I, and I totally agree. I, for, I feel like there, um, and, and I, again, you know, a lot of people go back and forth, but this idea that human flesh or our human bodies are somehow inherently evil it's this idea and i, I think there's a the gnostic <laughs> tendency going back you know 2000 years this idea that oh, correct you know f- the the material world is bad the spiritual world is good and so somehow we're in this conflict and i've, I've you know my understanding of christianity I, obviously i'm deconstructing all of that have been for many years but but what i received um the message i heard and, and that i or at least i interpreted this way was your just you being in your body, your the feelings that are natural, uh, that, that you know that we're, we're sexual beings, obviously, but like somehow that that yep. was not quite right. It it causes you to be at war within yourself, almost like I don't know how to. I mean, it's almost like your body turning on itself. It's like seeing it yourself as the enemy, which I think is like some spiritual form of uh, an autoimmune kind of thing. It's like it's like almost attack. That's exactly what that is. And it, That's exactly suffering. Right. That's and true because, suffering. Look, um, yeah. Okay. And you know what? Um, sexual flourishing isn't is is embedded in the way our mm-hmm. Creator made us, right? <laughs> like, I mean. If why we're so terrified of pleasure, of women's sexuality, of sensuality, um, is is beyond me. I mean, you can just look at the way our bodies mm-hmm. are created. I mean, it's to me in this book, I try and trace mm-hmm. the messages back. Right? I'm like, look, um, Augustine, God bless him, had some awesome things to say. <laughs> also, just like all of us, had a few hangups right? 
And, um, and so much of the stuff goes back to how people interpret the Garden of Eden story, mm-hmm. the creation story. And if you asked people, you asked 100 people, describe the Garden of Eden, they'd be like, they'd talk about an apple and Satan and temptation and sin and original sin and a fall from grace, literally none of mm-hmm. which is in the text. Not one of those things is in the actual text. And yet we believe in our whole idea of humanity and God has been formed because of one guy's interpretation. Mm-hmm. That's all mm-hmm. Augustine, right? And God, God bless him. Augustine had some hangups. You know, his original shame came from the fact that he was in a bathhouse with his father when he was when he was in puberty and he had an erection. And he was so ashamed of this and his father commented on it. And then what did he do? He spent the end of his career writing like 10 volumes on the garden of eden that's where he was talking about the fall from grace and original sin and all of this stuff and he said look you know what the condition of paradise before the fall a term he made up was was primarily surprise surprise that adam could control his erection (laughs) very very (laughs) like one okay that's just his shit okay so like one 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 dude, you know, in the what fourth century, takes a dump. The church encases it in amber, and says, "This is God's will and testimony and teaching for all people for all time." I'm looking at it, going, "Really? I think it's yes. literally one guy's shit." Unbelievable. Like, w- <laughs> Unbelievable. So, yeah. So, and also, I mean, even you look at. You look at what do we do with with the Song of Songs, right? First of all, we call it the Song of Solomon, not the Song of Songs. And it's potentially the only book that was penned by a woman. It's actually possible that it was written by a woman. And so much of it has to do with female sexual Mm. desire, a shameless, shameless female sexual desire and love for her body. And it's so beautiful, this erotic poem in the middle of the Bible. It's like it, it snuck behind enemy lines and stayed there. And uh, and then, but what happened, like Origen was like, oh no, no, no. We, this is not about sexual desire. This is about Jesus. Yeah, that, that, that is so frustrating. Okay, well, what was, or, what, was or, what was Origen's deal? Well, he was so terrified of sexual temptation he castrated himself is that the guy we want to listen to like this is the dude who we're gonna let form our opinions about an erotic poem in the bible um, he cut his balls off that, anyway so uh, well first of yeah. all thank you for sharing that that is that's a bit of history i think that most people are probably ignorant of um and and how it shaped um western views on sexuality um it's a shame because people cannot, you, I always tell people, you can't run from yourself. And if you make yourself the enemy, um, mm-hmm. we, it's, you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you've like, it's almost like you're, it's a, su- it's a spiritual suicide. Uh, and there's, and there's no way to overcome from it, right. you know? Um, but I, so I really appreciate you sharing that. I'm, uh, and I think your book is going to do, um, do really a, a lot of good in, in like exposing a lot of these, um, these sentiments that people don't really think about. Um, you know, I think I've heard people describe, um, I've heard the term thin places used a lot. So for example, um, you know, there are, there are certain thin places in the world or in life in which the line between this material plane and the spiritual plane is very thin. And I think sex is Mm. one of those places that it's Absolutely. very thin in the sense that people people really connect with the divine and have these mystical experiences of just great love and and understanding mm-hmm. of god through Absolutely. sexual sexuality and sexual experiences and that is so to shame that part of who we are which is i think what traditional christianity yeah. has done has, has destroyed the lives of so many yeah. people so I, thank you for bringing attention back to this well i I, I asked my boyfriend is uh, not Christian and I said, Hey, why, why do you think the church has tried to control sexuality for so long? And he didn't even skip a beat. He said, look, I, I guess I always assumed the church saw sex as its competition. Uh, wow. Yeah, I can see that. And, and in a way it's like, look, you know, both things are, are seeking unity. Like there's a, there's a way in which, holiness means union it means connection Mm -hmm. right and in both uh religion and sex i think that we are seeking to alleviate some of that existential aloneness that we have as human beings through unity right 
And so I think the church has always seen it as threatening exactly because of what you just Mm. said. Uh, what a shame, you know? Uh, yeah, just to think, uh, we kind of joke around on the podcast that Jesus, you know, Jesus got erections, Jesus was sexually aroused, you know, and even to say that can sure. like really raise the uh, the ire of some people, but it's like, no, there is like, we, our bodies aren't the problem. Like divinity isn't expressed uh, in spite of our, our humanity. It's expressed because of our humanity, you know? And I think that's yeah, the whole message of Jesus. Yeah. And just good to get back to that and to say, okay, there's no conflict here in our being. Um, okay. So uh, a question, I and mean, we're going to wrap up here because I know we're, we're running a little bit, um, we're running a, little, a little bit long and we're having some technical issues here, but um, the question, I guess the question that, um, that I would have, uh, you know, for you, I mean, as we're just transitioning is how do you deal with the concept of forgiveness? Like for, so for example, um, there's just been a lot of hurt that's caused by people. I think, you know, when you think of misogyny, you think of, um, you know, patriarchy and, and how that has just caused so much hurt, not just to, to females, which obviously I feel like women have, you know, experienced the brunt of that, but, but for males too, you know, I think this, this hurts all of us. Um, and, and, and the actions that come from that. And even when people are feeling shame in their bodies and uh, I think shame and feelings of lack, I mean, when you just project that onto others and that's where a lot of pain comes from and a lot of heartache comes from and abuse, there's just been a lot of abuse that's happened. How do you, how do you forgive that? Like, how do you forgive that in a way that first of all, doesn't, uh, demean what a victim has went through, but how do you mm. do it in such a way that honors the victimization of people, but also um, allows you to truly forgive and to not hold it against people? How do you reconcile with that? That's just, I think, been something that people have had questions about. And how do you move forward, especially with the Me Too movement? How do we hold, how do we not just create a reaction that is vitriolic, but in a way that holds, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, how? Yeah, it does. Well, first of all, I've been shocked this week because um, apparently this is a thing that people want to hear about much more than I or anybody else realized because um, this feminist media company made a series of videos of me talking about different stuff and they released them a week ago today. And there's a two minute video of me talking about forgiving assholes. And it's been seen well over 7 million oh my times goodness. in in one week. And now that, that has much less to do with me and much more to do with the fact that you're right. People, people are struggling with this. And, um, and I think that what we're experiencing right now culturally is, is a few different things. One is the sins of the father being visited on the next generation in the sense that I think that for so long, none of these issues were spoken of. Abuse was covered up nobody listened to victims at all, that there's been this pendulum swing to the, to, 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 to the extent that um, now that the truth is finally being spoken of, I think it's be, it, people are, are sort of reticent to move to forgiveness because it feels perilously close to entering that time again in which people weren't culpable, people were not held to mm-hmm. account. Um, and, and I don't think that that's true. And the the thing about forgiveness for me is not, sometimes we don't want to say, we don't want to forgive people or institutions or harm that's done us because it, it feels like we're saying, oh, that's okay. It's okay that that happened. It's okay that that harm was created. And so we don't want to, but to me, it's not about saying it's okay. It's about that until I move to a place of forgiving, um, I'm connected to that harm, almost like with a chain. Mm. I'm connected to it. I abs- I keep absorbing it over and over and over again. And sometimes it can find its that can find its way into my own heart and metastasize there. And so, um, to me, forgiveness isn't about saying it's okay what somebody did. It's about saying what you did is so not okay. I refuse to be connected to it anymore. Mm. And so um, it's bolt cutters that is just breaking the chain and saying, I'm letting that go because I can't <laughs> absorb your shit yeah. anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. So, oh. and I, and I mean, that's what Jesus always wants for us is freedom. I, I read the first three chapters of Mark probably half a dozen times this week because I'm preaching on the end of the third mm-hmm. chapter and oh my gosh, he's just 
it's so beautiful. The first three chapters, it's just stunning. It takes your breath away that every single thing he encounters, he sets somebody free. All of these systems, systems of illness, of mental illness, systems of families, systems of power, systems of religion. Every time he encounters it, he has a set of bolt cutters. Mm. Every time. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Amazing. Freedom, yeah. true freedom. That's so good. Thank you, Nadia. I so appreciate that. Um, for our listeners, um, how can people how can people follow you online or where, where how can people learn more about your work or or stay connected to to what you're doing? Um, let's see. I I think NadiaBoltzweber.com is still my website, although I never okay. maintain it. Uh, and um, you know, the book comes out, so they can um, they can pre-order Shameless: A Sexual Reformation. I think starting on Monday, okay, this so Monday. Shameless: coming. A Sexual and, uh, Reformation, and that's available on Amazon, yeah, yeah. Barnes and Nobles, anywhere books books are sold. And I think we're going to be making impurity rings. So I think we're going to be giving, give, giving people these silicone rings that say shameless on them. And I'm also instigating an art project in which women mail me their purity rings. And then I'm going to have those melted into a sculpture of a vagina, which I have literally promised to Gloria Steinem when I saw her a couple months ago. So um, that's all in the works, too. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. So keep an that, eye out. That's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> wow. Well, well, thank you so much for, for your time, for your generosity, uh, for, for you sharing uh, your heart. Sure. I think it's so, I think the yeah. work you're doing is so important. So I really appreciate that. And uh, we look forward yeah, to uh, introducing you to our listeners. Sounds good. Thanks That'd so much. Great. All right. Um, All take right. care, Nadia. Thanks so much. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah. Wow. And that, I, I love Nadia, man. That was a great interview. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was cool. That was really good. Jamal, you took over there at the end. I'm, I'm, yeah, man. I apologize, guys. No, it's all good. Get a word in. It's all good. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm sorry that I hit your guys' mute button. I yeah, what, what the hell, man? That's what it was. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have that kind of authority. Yeah. No, no, no. You're absolutely right with that. You don't need any more authority than you got. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Well, hey, um, you know, I, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm feeling a little unsettled this morning, guys. Why is that? I don't know. I just feel, I personally feel like we forgot something. Mm. And um, I don't know. I just, I don't feel like. Like in the, the intro? Show, well, I don't know. The show doesn't feel complete at this moment. And um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this caller, I think we have a caller that has a, has a, it may have a clue for us. Oh my God. They have a hotline. They have a hotline. They have a hotline. It's real. It's there. Oh my God. Oh, Jesus, H. Lucy, I can't the moon. Oh, man. That's it. That is it. This caller, whoever that, whoever that caller is, a brilliant. They're a genius. Um, actually, I we forgot to announce that we have a hotline, guys. We actually oh, have man. a hotline. This is incredible. And not only... Not only do we have a hotline, we figured we've get, been getting a lot of love to the hotline recently. And so we figured, and by the way, I think I've done my job, by the way. I'm just, I'm not trying to take credit for this, <laughs> but I really feel like I've done my job because people are starting to hear the news that we have a hotline. So we yeah. decided Fine. we're going to take an entire episode. So for those of you that are like, you know, getting really tired of the shtick and think that we're going <laughs> to drop it and quit it. We are actually, oh, oh, no, no, <laughs> no, oh, no. We're upping it. So we're going to do an entire okay. episode around this uh, historic and monumental idea that we have a hotline. <laughs> and uh, we're going to we're going to we're literally do a whole show around it. So that is our topic for the show today. We're literally going to address all the love that's been coming into the Heretic Happy Hour hotline recently. Yeah. And there's a lot. I mean, I, I'm just looking down these. We got a lot to get. So do you want to jump right into it? Or do we have to announce the number? Do people have that by now? Well, well what is yeah, the number? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. What is the number? number? I think it's... Uh, hang on. I think it's 2403 something. 2403... Heresy. Yeah, there you go. Heresy. Yeah. Heresy. Or, uh, or 240-343-7379. There we go. There we go. There That's it is. It. And, and people can call that anytime. I mean, it, it's... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or correct me if I'm wrong, you can text it too. Uh, that's true. I this believe true. I believe it is Text, textable. Textability. Yes. And and we do have a text. Do you can I read the first one? Please do. Please All do. right. Hello, heretic happy hour. Exclamation point. I went to the last live recording of the podcast. Well, great. That's wonderful. 
went for the delicious donuts, but stayed for the confirmation that my deconstruction is a beautiful thing. When my deconstruction first began, I would carry it as a huge burden that would hold me down. As time has passed and with conversation with people going through their own deconstruction, I've learned to embrace slash love mine. Thanks for an awesome night and keep doing what you're doing. Juan from Whittier, end quote. Well, thank wow. you. Yes, it is. Um, awesome. I think as we discussed, it is such a terribly lonely feeling, this whole deconstruction bullshit. And it is nice to come up with, uh, you know, into the lives of other people who have been doing it. And you're like, man, I'm not so alone. That is, and it's a good thing. It's, it's a tough thing. As we discussed, it models the, the grief cycle, but you know what? It's a beautiful thing too. Yeah. And you know, I think that's also what's really cool about the live podcast recordings is that you get to not only hear us, of course, which is the best thing hearing us just talk. That's obviously the best part. Right? But, the, but really the best thing about the live recording is that you get to be in a room full of, you know, 20, 30 people who have also gone through this same kind of deconstruction. And, and it really does help you feel like you're not alone. Um, so yeah, that's one of the great yeah. things about it. Yeah. And I, I, I think I, I really appreciate the text because um, I think there's something powerful about expressing gratitude. So, you know, when you're in this process, especially in the process of deconstruction, I mean, you can feel like there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that you once felt like you were confident in or knew or had. It can feel like loss. Actually, I was talking to um, my girlfriend last night and she was telling me about a friend of hers uh, that was talking about the deconstruction process. And this girl um, related it to her, her mother. So basically, she her mother passed away a few years ago and she said she went through all these the, these emotions of grief of losing her mother. And then she said, you know, I really didn't have anything to compare it to. And then until I connected the dots, like I'm grieving the death of God hmm. and, and, but it's her concept of God, the, the, hmm. this evangelical, you know, theistic kind of man in the sky, you know, you know, yeah. chess player controlling all the pieces. That's the concept of God that she's actually grieving the death of mm -hmm. and it's she's going through yeah. real grief emotions loss emotions and i think it's so when you're feeling that um and then you you're also gaining a lot too it's not just that you're losing you're also gaining you're gaining um reality you're gaining um just perspective you're gaining honesty all these things so i, I love that this call or this uh this person who's listening to the podcast who came to the to the the live show i love just the simplicity of saying thank you, thank you, for, or I'm appreciating the process, or just being grateful. So, just, so I think having a like not to be cliche, but an attitude of gratitude about what you are receiving, or what you're noticing, or what you're thankful for, can really be helpful in this process. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, yeah. so I think we have a voicemail, right? Hey guys, uh, my name is Sean DeRigger, and uh, I have a podcast. Shameless plug, watch out! Uh, podcast called The Armchair Philosopher. But I really appreciate what you guys are doing um, and the, the point that I'm at in my life uh, to, to welcome uh, welcome me to hear uh, a positive take on religion and theology and, and all that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate the podcast, and I've been binging episodes for the past few days, and uh, I'll be listening to more. So keep it up, and uh, God bless you guys. Yeah. You know what I love? I love that we get love from other podcasts. You know what I mean? I think that's really cool. Um, I mean, not all other podcasts love us, but um, I'm really glad that this guy took the time to leave a message and let us know that he's enjoying it. And you know, it's really cool because I, I have gotten in touch with other um, people that do other podcasts. Like I just talked yesterday to a guy from, it's called the Holy Heretics podcast. And um, and yeah, it was, it's a blast. I mean, those guys are really cool. And the Bros, Bibles, and Beer guys came to actually. They, I think they've been to almost every live one we've done. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool. It is cool to connect with other folks doing all this. Man, it's fun to talk all these super interesting folks doing things like what we're doing out out there. It's it's a blast. Yeah, have you guys ever heard of a, yeah. a podcast called The Lovecast? No, that's that's that no. sounds super. No, that sounds super stupid. shitty. <laughs> Well, that shut you up. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> well, no, but look, seriously, in all seriousness, um, what I think is great though is that um, I love that there are so many podcasts that are kind of 
Like, it's not a bad thing that there's a lot of podcasts right now from a Christian perspective that are, <clears throat> you know, dealing head on with these questions of like inerrancy and PSA and the eternal suffering and all that kind of stuff. I mean, um, it's great. It's a wonderful thing. And I think it's actually part of, I hate to call it a movement uh, because it's not something, it's certainly not something man-made. I think it's a legitimate movement, um, if you want to even say possibly of the spirit. But it's something where it's sort of like, you know, the BS is being exposed, the light is being shined in the dark places. And, uh, and, it, and it's encouraging to me that so many people are willing to do podcasts and to get out there and to, to expose some of the junk and garbage that we've grown up with. Um, it's a great thing. And I'm telling you, we're, we're, set, we're helping and We already see it, right? We're helping set people free from a lot of stuff that, you know, they're getting out from underneath the fear and control uh, of, of, of the church and really more in, moving more into truth and freedom, um, which I think is in Christ. So I think that's great. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You want to get into the next text? Let's let's do it. Can I read it? Is that okay? Yeah, please. Yeah, get on it. All right. Here's the, here's the next yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. text that we got in. Um, quote, hey guys, just started listening to your podcast and it has been so wonderful. It seems to be a human thing to want to find and be in a tribe. And I have to say, I think you guys have been a great comfort in seeing and knowing that I am not alone. Alone in my thoughts, my questions, and my desire to find fuller understanding in the divine. So thank you. You have given me great hope. Also, as a side note, just found out that Jamal is from around Columbus, Ohio, which which I was born and raised. So that's fun. Sherry from the state of Washington. Ooh. All right. You, you never heard All that right. Jamal was from Columbus, Ohio. He, I think, Jamal, you, you talk about it every every episode. Do I? Go, go, every. go, go Wolverine. No, 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 no. That's Buckeye. I, did I get that wrong? Go, yeah. Did I get that wrong? Isn't that, that's what he oh, says. Oh, my bad. Time. My bad. Yeah. They, yeah. No, no, Ohio something State like Wolverine. that. Ohio State Buckeyes, and I just would like to, like to say free Urban Meyer. That's what it was. I'll just leave it at that. Hey, say what say what you need to say. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Caller. I really appreciate that, that yes. encouragement. Uh, thank you. Yeah, really appreciate that, and it's awesome to to know that you're out there, and we really do appreciate hearing from the callers that uh, or the listeners that are just you know really being blessed by um, by the conversations. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It it really does. It means a lot. Um, please, please keep doing it because the encouragement really does mean a lot. Uh, just to know that we're having an impact, and um, honestly, it balances out all the negative crap that I hear from people. Like, why do you guys cuss so much, and why are you so you know negative, and blah blah blah. It's like, well, if you've got the kind of texts and voicemails and messages and emails that we get from people like that, who are so touched and so blessed and so set free, then like you'd get it. And maybe it's not for you. And, you know, we've already talked about that before. Right. Anyway, let's move to another text. Let's do it. Uh, I'll read this next. Yeah, get it. Uh, I think I think it has something to do with me here. So, uh, or at least he, he, he said my name here. So it says, hey, guys, Todd here. So glad to have found your podcast. I was listening to the B-I-B-L-E episode and kept getting confused. Keith kept referring to seeing Christ, following Christ, being like Christ. Often he linked it very closely to talking about Jesus particularly in the later part of the podcast. This didn't sound like a universal Christ as spoken of with Richard Rohr. So which is it? Well, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because um, that's something that I've been thinking about um, a lot lately. And I, I'm, I'm probably going to do a blog on that topic because I, I've noticed it as well popping up. And I, I feel like this is probably one of the areas where maybe the three of us aren't on the same page yet, or, um, or at least I think we come at this from different angles. So I know from from previous conversations uh, and, and previous podcasts that, uh, like Jamal, I know you you tend to take a pretty hard line between there's Jesus and there's Christ, <laughs> and <laughs> and that uh, and 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 honestly, I've thought about that right because I am really open and excited even by the cosmic Christ, and I've I've written about that as well. Uh, I'm really really into that the idea of the cosmic Christ and how even how we are connected to the cosmic Christ. But I guess for me personally, just to answer the text, and then we can we can talk about this if you guys want to. I guess for me personally, I I really do feel like Jesus is for me. Jesus is my personal touchstone. He's my he's my uh, connection to the Christ, uh, if you will. And so, like what I know about Jesus and what I learned from him, uh, I I am actively trying to follow Jesus. 
And so I will, you will notice, yes, sometimes I will interchangeably talk about Christ and Jesus. Um, I do, I do embrace the idea of a cosmic Christ, but I don't think that uh, there's a need to separate the cosmic Christ from the person Jesus, at least what we have revealed in the gospels about who Jesus was and the things that he taught. Certainly all those things are in line with uh, a cosmic uh, Christology. And so I don't think that Jesus is in any way, you know, he's not opposed to any of those things. I think the cosmic Christ does take it beyond the physical person of Jesus in many ways, and it even extends to us. But at the same time, I'm always drawn back to specifically to Jesus. And so uh, for me, it's not a problem, but you guys might have a different perspective. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'm sort of on the fence uh, on this whole thing because, and, and remain fairly agnostic um, simply because I think, and I, and I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, like this is a cop-out answer, but it's, it's a bit of a, a mystery because if we're saying, well, like, you know, if we want to follow the person of Jesus, it's like, well, that's, that's really, really difficult because, well, who was Jesus? Well, we, we can glean stuff from the gospels and from non-canonical texts, but we can only paint like a, a, a broad picture maybe. Um, so it's like, well, this this person, Jesus, lived in a first century Jewish context. I mean, that would be completely inappropriate, um, I think, in the 21st century, or at least certain things would be um, completely inappropriate to say, well, I'm behaving exactly like Jesus would in today's culture. That just might be weird. Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, I can't remove the Christ from Jesus, but can I remove the Christ from Matt? You know what I mean? Like, so right. it, it's mysterious because I'm still like, yes, Jesus is the icon of what God is like, at least in the first century as a Jewish man. But could God, could there be another perfect image of God in a different context? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so I, I kind of am agnostic in that. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. I, I do. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think this is a, this is a really, um, it, there is a lot of mystery to this topic. Uh, my, wh where I guess the angle, and Keith, you talked about this a little bit, but I, I think the angle I, I come from on this is, um, I, I do, my understanding of the Christ is that the Christ does transcend. I don't know that I would separate it from Jesus. It's just like, I don't know that I would want to separate Christ from any human being, but, um, but transcendent. I mean, I do believe Jesus, the man, um, made a huge, obviously huge mark on the world because of the, the fullness and in, 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 <clears throat> compared comparatively to the other humans, uh, the revel, the, I mean, there's a lot of names for it, but some people will say like an avatar that like this expression of the Christ, the Christ nature in a human body, like in a, in a human being, that this was a full expression in a way that was not, quite as full um, with other people. Um, but I do think if you look at history, you'll, you will see figures that have come, come on the scene that have been pretty magnificent expressions of this Christ. Um, maybe not to the extent of Jesus. And there could, you know, I think we could talk about like why Jesus is uniquely the, the expression of the Christ and the revelation of the Christ uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more full way. But again, I think he's just the firstborn among many others. And that's what that, that, that I mean, I love that, that verse from the Bible. So like there are many others and that's the whole point. So I think like when we start talking about Christ, for me, I'm, I, it's almost like <clears throat> when we talk about, have conversations and Keith wrote a book about this, but like how, how the concept of the word of God has been, been so boiled down to a book, you know? So like it's people refer to the Bible as the word of God, which we know is that's ridiculous because it's like, well, wait, no, there's nothing in, even in the Bible, if you're taking the Bible seriously, there's nothing even in the Bible that calls the book a word of God. It's actually talking about, uh, it refers to Jesus in that way, but it also goes beyond that. I believe um, when we understand the Christ consciousness, like when we refer to Christ as the visible image of the invisible God and Paul, refers to that to you know is referring to Christ I think Paul in his language sometimes can be I mean he, he he'll say Christ Jesus a lot and he'll kind of marry the two together but I think if we're going beyond that and and that's not a bad thing I mean that can raise a lot of flags for 
for some people, but it's like, if we're understanding the nature of the Christ, which is, and Richard Ward does talk a lot about this, then we understand that the visible manifestation of the invisible God is really all of creation. Um, uh, and this is, this is, this is a huge concept. So it's not just applying to Jesus. It's really, we're talking about all of creation as being the visible manifestation of the invisible, which we know to be the source, which is the divine, which is God. I mean, that's a, that's a, just a crazy, it's an amazing concept. So I feel like it, that's an important point for me to like emphasize in the same way that if we don't, then what we do in the same way that the word of God is reduced to a book, we take Christ and reduce it to one man. And I feel like that's an important, I mean, I think that's limiting the revelation of the Christ because Jesus is the revelation of the Christ, but the revelation is that there's so much more than just one man, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That could be a whole episode. I think it should be. Yeah. yeah. So let's move on to the next text before we get yeah. bogged down here. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, I'll take it. Do it. Uh, people talk about how lonely it can be to no longer have fellowship with a group. I'd like to point out that for introverts and agoraphobics like me, not being quote compelled to go to a building with 200 strangers is quite liberating. Amen. (laughs) I do wish I had fellowship, but I never really had that in the institutional church either. End quote. Yeah. um, I'm an introvert uh, myself. So I totally feel you like I, it's um, I think what we forget when we talk about, you know, coming together in fellowship is that for a lot of people that can be really, really exciting. It can give them energy, but we're not all built like that. And it can really, um, you know, this, the church model of, of, you know, we've all gone to church. I mean, they're all pretty similar and uh, greeting people and th- that can cause a lot of anxiety, at least it, it could be draining. And so, yeah, it's a good thing to remember. Like I think in our culture in, in the States, in the West, probably extroverts are like the norm. Like if you're introverted, it's commonly like misunderstood what that even means, um, and it's almost like looked down upon, like there's something wrong. When as you know, it's just a different way of, um, it's just a different way you process things and the way your body responds to situations. So that's a good quote. But at the same time, yeah, fellowship in some manner is definitely yeah. needed. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, <clears throat> I think the unfortunately the the kinds of fellowship, quote unquote, I want to put those in quotes, fellowship that we have in yeah. in a Sunday morning sort of mega church or even just a typical church gathering. Well, some of it is really kind of forced right. and fake. And um, and I don't think that kind of fellowship will actually help anyone at all. Actually, and it actually could be damaging, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert. Right. Um, because right. I think it sends a whole bunch of wrong, false messages. But, um, but, uh, but uh, you know, if it's a real, I don't know, I've gotten way more fellowship out of just smaller groups of people, like four or five people, that I really love and I know they really love me. And, uh, and then it doesn't matter what we're doing. We could be playing a board game. We could be watching a movie together. We could just be sitting around having coffee and talking and laughing and uh, going camping together or whatever. I mean, I think those kinds of, and that see, to me, that's closer to like a friendship and that's a real emotional connection with other people. To me, that is what Ecclesia is. What, what, what is the Greek word mm. for church? To me, that's what it really should be. It really should be more like a family. And, and, and it's only more like a family if you actually do things like families do. Uh, it's not a family just because you use family language from the pulpit and you start trying to right. sort of artificially enforce we're a family brother. But, but be, it doesn't ever go beyond that, right? It's got to actually be something where you actually, you actually look around the room and say, man, I love these people. I, I love them the way I would. Sometimes maybe even I love them more than I love my own family. Uh, I connect to them in a deeper way than I even I connect with my own family. Um, That's the ideal. But I also recognize that even though I have something like that in my life, so many Christians really, really don't, and they're really desperate for that. And I, I have a burden for that, and I would, I, I would love to help people find something as close to that as possible if I can, because I think it, it can do so much in our lives emotionally spiritually there's so much healing and growth that that really i think can only happen in those kinds of uh gatherings and communities yeah i would would agree and i think um i think the picture that comes to mind sometimes is like um having on those these glasses that are like 
you know, really dark glasses and they filter out, you know, all the light and you can't see anything. So like, let's say, let's say you put on a real dark pair of shades, sunglasses, and, 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 um, literally it's like blacks out everything and you feel all alone. You're like, man, there's nobody here. And, um, and then once you take the glasses off, you look around and you go, Oh, there's people, the room's filled with people. And I feel like <laughs> doctrine and religion in, in many ways, it just blinds you from seeing people. You know, you can't see people. You feel alone because there are people who don't believe like you or, you know, that kind of thing or, or think the way you do. And this can apply in all kind of different contexts. And I feel like, you know, once you just start understanding that, no, 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 like we're not alone. There are people everywhere. Once we stop seeing people through grids of do people believe like me? Are they on the same page as me? Do we, you know, all these kinds of things, then we can, then we can actually see that they're there and they exist. We can begin to appreciate them for who they are and where they are. And then, we don't feel alone anymore. Um, and mm. I know, I think that that's a challenge for us because we've just been so ingrained at these different layers of just looking for like mindedness, which is not a bad thing. It's a human. First of all, I feel all human beings have an inherent need for human connection and love. Like, I don't think that's a mm. choice. I think that's just something that we are, we are hardwired for. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I just, and I think, so it, it's a legitimate, I think it's important to acknowledge that we have that need, but, but then, and then to recognize that the need, the fulfillment for that need exists, you know, cause it, cause it's like sometimes the thought of like, well, the thing I need is not there can really feel like torture. Um, but it, but that's just, it's, it's not true. The thing we need um, is actually all around us. And that's, I think the beauty of coming out of these, these, layers of deconstruct or this religion because it's like it is literally giving you back the thing that you need which is we need to be connected with other people we need to be connected with the creation all around us and that's what we're able to do the more we come out of these mindsets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right let's get into the next one then good morning my fellow heretics from new england my name is nathaniel and i'm calling you this morning to ask your opinion and thoughts about uh, mission trips. Um, I am a follower of Christ, but I would not call myself a Christian. And growing up in my church, or growing up in the church, I should say, my entire life, I've seen a lot of people go on mission trips, come back, tell their stories, weep a little bit, and life resumes as it was prior to their leaving for that mission trip. Um, personally, I think they're a waste of time. I think that if we're to impact uh, our communities and even our, you know, if we are to expand from our communities and go outward into the nation, some people might say this is a great commission, but I beg to differ. Um, <clears throat> I think helping out other people should be uh, tangible. It should be something that is more than just slapping on a new coat of paint to a school or making a building or a house or whatever. And it just seems very uh, touristy. It seems very gimmicky that, like, you know, we're, we're doing this for God. We're doing this for the other people. And it's like, then why are you taking a million selfies of yourself? over in Africa with the people <laughs> that you're supposed to be serving or you proclaim to be serving in the background. It just seems all too uh, manufactured. So, yeah, I guess that's my question. What's your thought about mission trips? Uh, good stuff with the podcast. I love listening to you to my, during my commute in the morning. Uh, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> of my... It would be my audio version of coffee. I do have my coffee on my way to work, but certainly listening to you guys talk and your guests, wonderful stuff. All right, keep up the good work. Signing out, Nathaniel from New England. Bye. Wow. Well, I think Nathaniel from New England is dead right uh, on everything he just said. I, it reminds me of, of a friend, Skeeter Wilson. He's a he's also a listener to the podcast, and he also was a he was a missionary's kid and I think he was in Africa. I want to say Kenya, but I don't remember exactly where it was. But um, at any rate, my gosh, we should have him on the show sometime because he could blow your mind uh, with really just a lot of what Nathaniel just talked about, like how missions is actually 
it's counterproductive to sharing the gospel. Actually, it ends up sharing more of the culture. Like we, we, uh, we're sharing American culture and American Christian culture more than we're sharing the gospel. Um, yeah, it, it's more about us than it really is about the people that we're supposed to be trying to evangelize. There's just so much negative, toxic stuff associated with it. I think my friend Skeeter, um, was talking about this and he told me that there was some, some example he had found, or, or no, I think it was, uh, he was either Wycliffe or one of the Bible societies, one of the Bible translation societies. It might've been Wycliffe. That Wycliffe had, had even done a study and found that um, it was actually faster and more productive and more long lasting to, um, to allow someone indigenous to a particular tribe to, um, to learn English and, and read the Bible and then communicate the Bible. Like, translate the Bible themselves to their own people in their own context and culture. Uh, it, it only took, I think like three or four years maximum, whereas it takes like 10 years for, for an American person to learn their language and then translate their, you know, the Bible into their language. But of course, not knowing or understanding any of their cultural uh, background that it ends up actually causing so much confusion and damage in the long run. It, if you want to see examples of that, I recommend you watch a movie called Silence uh, by mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese. It's excellent uh, on that, and it, it kind of points out the negative impact and dangers of uh, missions. And there's also another movie called The Mission, which I think is a, a beautiful bookend to that movie that also kind of shows how quite often missionary work is political. The people on the ground, the missionaries don't really know that until it's too late. They think they're just there to share the gospel when they realize it's a power play that their government is sort of working in tandem with the church to send missionaries again, and very specifically to bring the culture um, so that it's easier for the, the empire later on to come and, sort of take over that culture. So it's, it's, it's all screwed up and mixed up with a whole bunch of other toxic crap. Mm. Um, I'm not, a, not a fan of the way we do missions nowadays. I think it is, it, like he said, it's more of a vacation for us um, than it is anything, anything positive for those people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of uh, proselytizing, uh, traveling, you know, I think even Jesus talked about, didn't he say something about the Pharisees? He's like, you'll travel over, you know, over land and sea to, to make a convert. And you really, what you do is you make them twice the, the children of hell or, or death or however you want to do that. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a, there's a quest. There's something about tribes that want to convert other people into the tribe to make the tribe bigger, to kind yep. of take over. It's part of that tribal kind of mindset. And again, you, like you said, Keith, you've yes. talked a lot about this about it, about like it's really more just exporting nationalism. So I I, yep. I think that's just it's hogwash. But I am a huge proponent of travel because I think travel um, is a great way to like see through a lot of the bullshit that's out there. You know, I remember traveling. Um, it's not too long. I mean, the, the Iraq war was still happening, uh, you know, 2006, 2007. I remember having the opportunity to, to go there, um, went there two or three times. Um, and I was blown away. I was like, wait a minute, this is nothing. Again, I, you know, there were hot spots, so I, I wasn't there, but like parts of the country I was in, I was blown away with how, how ridiculous what we see in the news is. It's like, no, these are people just like us. Their life is going on just like, <clears throat> you know, these aren't terrorists. These are, you know, these are real, you know, men, women, and children, families. They have, I mean, it's just, I was, there were times I forgot where I was and never felt endangered where I was at. Um, I remember visiting, you know, the West Bank and Israel, um, the occupied territories, meeting with Palestinians and uh, <clears throat> going to Egypt, Jordan, you know, all these places. And just like realizing that, man, you know, we were there. We took a trip. I ended up taking a trip with like 12 people and people called it a missions trip. And I was even still in that world. I was, I was still a pastor at the time, but I, we distinctly went on this trip for the purpose of not doing anything or like trying to impart anything, but really to learn from the, from the people where we went. And that I think really set us up to deconstruct. I didn't know it at the time that that was going to be a major factor in my deconstruction. But I remember when we went to, you know, 
China and, and Tibet um, and India and a lot of those places, the things we experienced there, we really learned a lot. At least I did. I learned a ton um, subconsciously that really aided years. And I'm still to this point, you know, like still taking insights from that trip. And it's, it's, it's for my purpose of my development and my evolution. And yeah, of course, I think once we see that we're all connected, there are things that different people can do to help one another. I think there are things that we can do in the West to help less, um, you know, less people with less access to resources. Totally. I think we can do that, but it's a very far cry. It's very different than proselytizing or exporting nationalism. So that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, um, if you want to dig a fucking well for people who don't have water, do it. But I don't, yep. I don't think you need to be like, Oh, by the way, I need to mention Jesus. I need to mention Jesus real quick. And then, and then bounce. It's like, come on, just dig the fucking well. Jesus does not care. You, he, he doesn't be like, make sure you mention me or you're going to go to hell. Like, come on, this just, just go help someone. That's, that's all. I, but we're going to have a dig the effing well. <laughs> Jesus says, dig the, just dig well. the fucking well. <laughs> but we're going to have, a, um, actually I'll be, I'm going to, uh, Shameless plug for our next live show in one month, September 8th. We're going to be doing a live show. I'm going to be fly- actually choirs flying me down. That's that's how I roll, you know, flying me down oh, to the orange baby. to the OC to, to see you guys. And we're going to be talk. We're going to do a whole thing on the church and missions and all and all this stuff that has to do with the church. That's just going to get that's basically going to be the Keith Giles episode. And it might be the because I think you're the only one who does a church. <laughs> um, maybe. But I think it's where we're going to maybe diverge the most. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm yeah. wrong, but um, I, I foresee that maybe That's us coming from completely different angles on that, which would be exciting. Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> sounds like it might even get a little heated. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I guess brings us to our next text. Let's get into the next one. It's a, it's a short one. Please talk about tithing. Um, okay. But I thought we, I thought we just said that we're gonna right we we're gonna talk Ex- about exactly. But that's the next text we got. So, so should should we? <clears throat> should, I'll just say real quick. Don't do it. Right there. No, don't <laughs> don't do it. Short answer. But yeah, we'll talk. Well, maybe we'll expand on that later. Explain why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I guess the next one. The next one. Let's let's jump right into it. Quote, and this is a good one. How much do I have to give you? to stop asking for money like a televangelist <laughs> and <quote. laughs> more, oh, how more. Much money, how much money do you more. think? Should that be a, maybe that should be a tier on the Patreon page. <laughs> uh, if, we, if we get $2,000, we'll stop talking about yeah. money. How, how about if we don't have to do all this shit for free all the time, then we'll stop. Huh? 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 Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But I do. Can't, I mean, Am I allowed to mention something about money or do we need to save this for... Are you plugging your next book? No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't want to yeah. plug my next <laughs> book just yet, but um, I think, again, I hate tithing because it, it, it to me, the idea of tithing is, is all about obligation and duty, um, right. which... And I hate the word supposed or this is what we're supposed to. I think we should cross that word out of the English vocabulary. Like so nobody does anything if they're supposed to. Or they shouldn't at least, because that's detrimental. Or, or like duty and obligation. I just hate that. There's a higher way to live. But as far as money goes, stop shooting. Yeah, there's no shooting. There's no shooting in the in, in, in yeah. the stop shooting on me. You should not live shooting. So anyway, <laughs> um, I feel like um, <laughs> there is something powerful though about the the reality of generosity, and I, that's that's very different than tithing. And I think Jesus talked about this. When he said, you know, give and it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I know that, that that is abused by, I'm sure people will say these prosperity preachers abuse that. But it is, I I believe it to be not something that God is like, hey, if you give me money, I'll give you money. It's like, I don't necessarily see God as the one, you know, being like this distributor. I think it's the way the universe is put together, right. though. Like there's a, there's the, there's a, there's these certain laws that are true. Just like, just like, you know, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You know, it's like the law of sowing and reaping. These are real things. So when it comes to money, I, and I personally have experienced this, the more I feel that I'm not lacking, that I feel like, I mean, there are times I literally feel rich. But again, if you look at my bank account, I'm not rich. But it, I, there's times I feel wealthy and I'll just be very 
generous with my money, it's amazing the flow that comes in when I'm feeling that way and acting on that. And I think that's what Jesus is yeah. talking about. So I think there's something, there's something real, there's something really powerful in this understanding of we live in a generous universe, a plentiful universe. The universe, if you just study nature, it's very, very plentiful and generous. And um, and I think if we live in, in line with that and flow with that, we could alleviate poverty in the world. I really believe that. Um, but oh, absolutely. but anyway, that's, there's more that we could be said on that. But I, I kind of wanted to mention that. Yeah. So in other words, keep giving us money until we tell you to stop. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. That, that's the answer. Right there. Uh, <clears throat> who wants right. to get the next one? <clears throat> All right. So uh, let me read this next text. It says, um, I hear from the three of you of the importance of relationship and hearing from God. What does a relationship with God look like? How do you have a relationship with God when you struggle to hear from him? How do you know that what you believe you hear from God is from him when other people tell you with such certainty they have heard from God, but what they hear doesn't match up? As the process of deconstruction continues, I tear down my previous beliefs, but want to replace them with authentic relationship. But how do I get there? If you tell me it's reading my daily bread devotional, I'm switching to John MacArthur's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't blame you. Go for it. Well, um, well, I, that's a great question, man. That is such a, honestly, this is really, a really foundational question. And it is something also that I'm, um, I'm trying to understand because like, you know, my book, Jesus Unbound, I talk a lot about this too. And about how, you know, our relationship isn't with a book, it's with a person, it's connecting, it's abiding in Christ and him abiding in us and us, you know, we can hear the voice of the, of, you know, the good shepherd. Jesus says, you know, my sheep hear my voice. And they know me and all that. Um, and I do feel like getting in connection with God, with the cosmic Christ, however, whatever you want to term it, uh, is a very important thing. But I think the breakdown comes from the language we use when we say, when we talk about it in the terms of hearing the voice of God. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, for me, I do, I would say that I do hear God. But I don't mean it like I hear an actual voice, you know, in the air. Um, it's not ever really that specific or clear. And it's not sort of something I can control. I can't just instantly, you know, it's not like using a walkie talkie or something or like a, a phone and going, hey, God, what's up? Um, <clears throat> it isn't like that. But I think the language sometimes is a barrier for people because uh, I, th I, th I think bottom line, we all sort of hear God or connect to God in different ways. And so the problem is exactly, for example, I think I'm part of the problem. When I say, when I use language that says that I hear God's voice, I know what I mean and I know what I experience, mm -hmm. but I think I'm communicating something, an expectation to people that isn't their way of connecting to God. And so they just mm -hmm. assume that they don't or that they can't. Mm. So, so uh, then, that, then it becomes very difficult. Like, well, so then how do I communicate it? I think, um, so I think it's hard. Uh, I, I do recognize that there are many people who um, have tried very hard to hear God's voice and, and will just say, I've never have, I've never had any kind of spiritual experience, any kind of a supernatural experience. I've never had God answer a prayer in some miraculous way. I never had a dream or a vision. I never had this, you know, sort of thought that came out of nowhere right. that, that led me to some big, uh, truth or, or, or discovery. <clears throat> and so what do you do with those kinds of things? Um, I don't know. This is, this, this could even be its own topic too, I think for a podcast. Uh, I wonder sometimes if, and then I'll, then I'll stop talking and you guys can tell me what you think, but, but I've noticed even in my own life, even though, like I said, for me, it's not difficult. I think sometimes to hear God's voice and to connect with him. I can remember a couple of years ago, I was trying, I was on purpose trying really hard to hear God's voice. And I was like getting up early in the morning and listening to worship music and spending time in silence and, and all that. And you know what? I didn't hear a thing. I heard squat. It was an absolutely the most empty and pointless uh, exercise I've ever done. But then when I just gave up on that and relaxed and just lived my life, it was like all of a sudden all that came back to me and was like, no, I, I do hear God. I do experience God. And it was just in my everyday ordinary life. It wasn't when I sat down and sort of tried to focus and 
try really hard. It was almost like that shut it down versus just getting up in the morning, brushing my teeth, having my coffee, you know, mm -hmm. driving to work and living my life. And it was then all of a sudden it was like a natural flow. Uh, it was like, I felt like, oh yeah, there, God's with me. He's here. And I don't have to try so hard to force something to happen. So anyway, yeah. I, I don't know if that's really answering the question or not. I think it's, I think it is a struggle for many people. And I definitely want to acknowledge that, that for many people, they don't really have uh, spiritual experiences. Yeah. I think, I think it just, um, I, I like what you said at the end. I think when you try to do something like that, you've already lost, <laughs> you've defeated the perfect, like, like, uh, in, in the boot, in the Buddhist tradition, grasping at Nirvana is to completely miss the point because yeah. Nirvana is not to be grasped at. Um, that's great. And I, I think just how do you live in relationship with God when you, when love others, love, love the creation, get, right. you know, ag agape, this, this notion of like self emptying, self sacrificial love for the other. You don't fuck the language, like just of God or what we name God or, or how we just, I mean, that's all theology is fun and all that, but just love others. And that, that is when you will be in right relationship when you're merciful, when you're all the fruits of the spirit with the, you know, the, the, when, when you're a good tree and you're producing good fruit, all these things will naturally flow from your life. You'll be merciful. You'll be loving. You'll be forgiving. Yep. Yep. And, and that that's being in relationship with God. And I believe, I mean, at least in my experiences, when you stop trying to label it and grasp at it, you get the, you get the blessings of that relationship. And, and it may be all these blessings that that might be how you hear God through other people and living in yeah, your yeah. life oriented in love with others. And if the incarnation's true, that's going to be how it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. dude. <clears throat> that's right. Yeah. Uh, some thoughts I have about this. This is a great question, by the way. And I, I think it's probably one of uh, a really important question. Um, when it comes to, I think one of the things, <laughs> there's a phrase that comes to mind and it's stay in your head and you're dead. <laughs> but I, I feel like, <laughs> The, the trying to figure out what is God's voice, what is your voice, what is another voice, whatever, trying to parse that and figure that out is a total mental concept. And, and it's, it keeps you in your head. And I honestly think that, um, I, one of the, a uh, verse from the Bible I really do love is, uh, Psalm 46 10, which says, be still and know that I am God. And I actually think there's a lot of truth in that statement. There is something about stillness that helps you have a knowing of the divine. It's a knowing of the voice, of the texture, of the, and it's not the thoughts. <clears throat> it's you have mm -hmm. to literally go beyond the thinking mind. It's still. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh -huh. Yeah, because the, the, yeah, mi that's really the good. mind is thinking all the time. The mind is always, you got this thought, 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 but it's when the stillness comes that you perceive. So sometimes that what helps me in this context is not to try to hear from God as if God is a separate being from myself. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but I don't believe that God is separate from us. You know, we, <laughs> we, can, we can use the words distinction and all that, but ultimately what helps me is when I just listen. Stop trying to, I, I'm not trying to listen to God. I'm just trying to listen. So when I listen, usually what I hear is a voice that is profoundly mine. And it's, it's my voice from this deep inner place. And it, it, I recognize it as my voice, but I also think it's God's voice as well. But again, if you try to think about that, then you lose it. So it's just, just maybe, maybe take a, I mean, as you're going through this process, maybe just drop kind of like what, what Keith said and Matt said, like, drop the expectation of trying to hear from God and just try to hear and just listen, mm -hmm. just get still and quiet and don't worry about if this voice is God or this is your voice. Cause again, that's drawing, that's may, I believe that that is an unhelpful separation. So mm -hmm. just, I think there's a, there's a, there's an intelligence that runs really deep within you and you have access to it and it's your intelligence. It's your voice. Um, but I also believe that, that you are, a possessor of the divine nature. It's mm. not outside of you and it's not separate from you. So you can, uh, but, but, but I think the perception that God is some being out there to be listened to can be very unhelpful. So I don't know if that makes sense. Those are some thoughts I've had. Those are great. I thought you were going to tell them that, that you hear the voice of Mary Magdalene and that <laughs> you, that's how you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, have. I feel like I have. So uh, I, I got a, we got a text here, I think, which is great. Um, and I agree with this text, by the way. So this text says, there should be a new sound effect every time Keith agrees with Jamal. Yeah, there you go. And I think that's great. Because it, it just right. happened a second ago. Oh, it oh, just oh, happened. Hold on a minute. Maybe, maybe what's happening, though, is Jamal's agreeing with me. Yeah, you, you tell yourself that, Keith. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, but I think I agree. And I think maybe it should be a uh, like a sort of a Tinkerbell harp sound effect. You know, like, bling, something like that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Pro- production team is on it. All right. Yes, thank you for that text, by the way. <laughs> so we got an, uh, a voicemail next, right? Hi, this is Daphne calling from Colorado. I really enjoy your podcast, and thank you so much for all the great questions and discussion. Um, I have two questions that I would love it if you could um, tackle at some point. First of all, what do we make of our conversion experiences, especially when our lives changed as a result, which was my experience. We just watched the movie, I Can Only Imagine, and that's the message that um, is brought through. So I would just love to hear what you guys all think about your own conversion experience now. And secondly, um, you know, people always say that Jesus spoke more about hell than about heaven. and um, especially his parables of the sheep and the goats, the good tree and the bad tree, you know, that at the end of the time there will be this um, sort of separation, the good fruit, the bad fruit, the wheat and the tares. I have my own um, ideas about what he meant on that, but I haven't actually heard anyone concur with those ideas, so I would just love it if you at some stage could discuss that, and I would love to hear your thoughts. So thanks, guys. Keep up the good work, and uh, love to hear back from you. Wow, I, that was a great voicemail. I just got to say though, why does it sound like she's recording that from like a closet somewhere? Like it sounds like she's hiding in the in the dark in a closet with the door shut, like and you know, afraid someone's going to catch her calling the hotline or something like that. <laughs> I think I think she's she's hiding from Jonathan Edwards' as God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, just kidding, Bethany. That we, you're yeah. you. Uh, you have a beautiful voice. That was really yes, great. Yes. Um, can I the kids can, were asleep. can I say something about the heaven and hell thing real quick? Oh yeah, please do. That's that's a, that's a myth. Um, there's it, it, it's the the fact that I know I've heard people say it. I, I think I've heard people like Mark Driscoll say that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. First off, well, yes. Well, yeah, it's BS. I mean, um, the, it's just patently false. I. And I talk about it in, I forget, some, one of my books. I've got four books. You can buy them all and find it. Help me help me out because I don't know where, where <laughs> I mentioned it. But um, Please go buy all four books and help <laughs> us find out where, where Matt uh, where, where, Yes, that is, that is the task I'm charging everyone now. Um, I think, a quest. Can we try not to talk about money? Guys, we're talking about money a lot. Oh, uh, yeah. Money. Fuck that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think maybe like 3% or something. Or Jesus talks about hell and it's like the kingdom of God. He talks about like over 10% of his sayings or exactly. verses or how, whatever um and 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 there's a lot of interpretive there's a lot of interpretations on all of those verses anyway so let's say he did talk about hell a lot well there's there, there's there's universalists who interpret that there's annihilationists who interpret it there's eternal torment folks you know the augustines and the edwards who interpret it and we're all over the map on it so um yeah i mean it's um and then the first, the the first one, the conversion experience. I I, I don't know if I really had a uh, a conversion experience personally, so I, I probably don't have too much to say about that. I mean, I have converted, I've repented of my theology, I've changed my mind, but I haven't had a Damascus Road event or something like that. Yeah, uh, I like though, but I like what she said though about because um, she said she herself had had sort of a right the conversion experience in the conversion experience in the sense of a transformed light. Right. I would agree with that. I, think, I yeah. think the mistake that we make, mistake is when we um, we treat the transformed life, the conversion experience, as if it's a One validation side. of an entire oh. belief system right. called evangelical Christianity sure. or whatever the theology is. Oh, I happened. I was attending a, a reformed uh, Calvinist church when that happened. Right. So on that Sunday when I walked forward, so therefore that was God so saying, therefore. I am all over all that theology right. and doctrine. Like, no. As if God can't the transcend the theology, right? <laughs> oh yeah. So, so I think that's the mistake. Like I would, right. I would affirm that yes, 
you had an experience with God and there was a transformation that should, by the way, not only be about that particular Sunday when you went forward and prayed a prayer, but should be the, your entire life should be a conversion experience and a, right. and a transformation experience um, right. uh, ongoing. And, but <clears throat> yeah, and I think I grin, I'm, g- I'm glad you mentioned the thing about hell. Cause I, I think all those references about hell that we think Jesus, uh, when they say, oh, this is, this is a verse of Jesus talking about hell. I don't think he's talking about where we go when we die. I think it's more of an apocalyptic message about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. Mm. Uh, and it's a warning about, hey, listen to my words and you'll be saved. Or you, if you don't listen to my words and you don't stop what you're doing, you're going to end up getting slaughtered by the Romans right. in about 40 years. And they did. Right. Anyway, that's my. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, just I, a thought that comes to mind about conversion, I think maybe any time we begin to relate um, our, our, whenever our foundational story changes. And we begin to relate to a, a new self or new part of our, our, our true self. Then we have what we, you know, what some people consider a, a conversion experience. I know for me, that's what happened. I part of my story and the quest of my life. I mean, I really felt insignificant and and really was asking lots of questions from an early age. Like, are we just here to like, you know, get a job, pay the bills, and? Um, just kind of survive in life, and because that's what what my foundational message is. That was, you know, my that was what I witnessed at home, and this is the highest goal in life was surviving and making a good living and and taking care of yourself and that kind of thing. And I just thought to myself, like, is that it? Because I wanted life to be about so much more. So I remember in my conversion experience, one of the things I've, I really felt like I came awake to was that life is so much more than eating and drinking and finding a place to live and paying your bills. Like there is so much more to life and that radically affected me. And I think that anytime we have a change in our foundational, uh, the way we're viewing ourselves or life, then you're going to have what is consult, call, called a conversion experience. But I feel like then I've had so many conversion mm. experiences over the years <laughs> that when I have them in you, you try to think back to your life before you had this revelation or epiphany. And it's hard to even imagine yourself because you've had such a change in how you perceive yourself or God or people right. or that kind of thing. So conversion experiences are very real, but I think it's a reassociation or reidentification with a higher self. That's my, that's how I would put it now. I would never say that before, um, but that's how I understand it now. It's good stuff. All good right. Stuff. Well, so maybe we should jump on. This has been great. Yeah. I think we should do the uh, last voicemail and maybe uh, okay. wrap it Let's up. Let's do it. we got a suspicious caller. Hey guys. Um, I just wanted to call the, the hotline to leave a voicemail and to say that I've really been enjoying uh, the Heretic Happy Hour podcast episodes. I really, uh, Jamal is my favorite, favorite really host, funny. obviously. And, that sounds uh, familiar. I agree with everything he has to say. <laughs> and, yeah. um, I also wanted to um, just say that um, – it's nice that you guys, you know, regularly like talk about the hotline and that there's a number to call. <laughs> and I really enjoyed, I just want to also say that I really, I really think the best episode you guys did was the one about Mary Magdalene. Oh, yeah, for fuck's sake. And I think uh-huh. it's all, yeah. yeah. I think it's settled. To, I mean, I don't think it's really in debate anymore about, about that. So anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. Keep up the good work, guys. Take care. Go Bucks. That, uh, I think I've heard that voice before somewhere. Yeah. Well, we'll just edit. Uh, we can we can do okay. some post editing and have our producer cut that part off, and we can just wrap it up right before that, right? Because that was <laughs> that was pretty. That lame. was very. Yeah. That was very lame. <laughs> I, I like some of it, but the fact that Jamal's his favorite of the three is that's that was the dead that's, giveaway. That's, right? a, yeah, that was that's a reach, man. <laughs> well, I I can understand why you guys might take offense to that, but I just want to. I don't want the caller to feel. No, yeah, thank, I mean, you. thank you. Thank you for, for the call, but you're wrong. Voicemail and, Whoever that was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Awesome. Well, this was good, man. Really good stuff. Thank you guys for calling uh, in and, and uh, voicemails and texts yeah. and all that. Please keep it going. Um, we love you guys. We love hearing from you guys. And um, we're going to keep, yeah. keep doing yeah. this. And we have a we have a live show. Guys, you, you need to make yes, plans to September come out 8. to our live show. Yeah, September the 8th. And buy, buy yeah. our shit at heretichappyhour.com. <laughs>